It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The headline in the Toronto Star read, Premier Wynne blasts John Tory over his budget complaints. You know, the Premier refused to meet Mayor Ford, and now the Premier is attacking Mayor John Tory. There is one common denominator here in this equation, and that's the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give the Premier a chance to apologize to Mayor Tory for this recent attack. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have a very strong working relationship with, uh, with John Tory. We have a long, long-standing relationship, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> One born in conflict but forged in those days of conflict into a very strong bond. We have a very collegial and collaborative style. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that there's a disagreement at this moment, and I understand that there will be disagreements from time to time, but my modus operandi, Mr. Speaker, is to keep talking, to make sure that we find a way through the challenges and that we get to a good place because, Mr. Speaker, the people of this province and the people of this this city and every municipality in Ontario want all levels of government working together, Mr. Speaker. They know that that's how problems get solved and that's how government and communities are strong, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. You know, the Premier is talking about her great relationship at Toronto City Hall. Well, the Premier said, I quote, there are statements being made out of City Hall that are simply not true. She implied that she wasn't having, I quote, a fact-based debate and conversation what? with Mayor John Tory and Toronto City Council. The Premier is trying to imply that Mayor John Tory and his City Council are not telling the truth to the people of Ontario. She might as well be saying, liar, liar, pants on fire, the way she's cascading this, yeah. this City Hall. This is not a constructive relationship. The way the Premier is attacking Toronto City. Stop the clock. If we, uh, if we need to return to the last couple of days uh, with warnings, I will fulfill that. And I will not take a long time to decide to do it. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, this attack on the mayor in Toronto City Hall is not acceptable for a proper working relationship. So, Mr. Speaker, let's give the Premier one more chance. Question. Will you apologize to the mayor of here, Toronto here. and Toronto City Hall? Here, here. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, um, let, me, let me just talk about this relationship with the, the City of Toronto. Let me first talk about it in the, cons, in the context of investments in transit and transportation infrastructure, because I believe that one of, the, one of the largest challenges confronting not just the City of Toronto, but the region of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area is transportation, Mr. Speaker. So let's, let's talk about some of the investments. And we are uh, funding, we must not forget, we are funding 70% seven zero percent of the transit projects that are being built in the city of Toronto right now, Mr. Speaker. And those include $5.3 billion for the Eglinton Crosstown, $1.2 billion for the Finch West LRT, $3.7 billion for GO uh, Regional Express Rail within Toronto, which will enable SmartTrack, which is the plan that the mayor ran on, Answer. Mr. Speaker, $150 million for planning and design for work on the Toronto Relief Line, which is a future project, Mr. Speaker. We are showing Toronto a lot Thank of you. love, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and su surprise, surprise, there is no apology to the Mayor, and the Premier seems to be okay with the fact that she called Toronto City Hall and the Mayor a liar. That's not a proper relationship with Toronto City Hall. Now, let's see the specifics of what Mayor Tory has raised as legitimate concerns for the City of Toronto. Tor stop, stop the clock. We're going to warnings. That's enough. Finish, please. Toronto Community Housing has an ambitious 10-year, $2.6 billion capital plan. The city, the province, and the federal government all need to be part of this. The city has made their commitment. The federal, have, the federal government has stated that they're interested in paying their share. The province, other than a few energy retrofits, absolutely nothing. Mayor Tory is right to be upset. Yeah, yeah. Toronto City Hall is, ups is right to be upset that this government is absent from the conversation. So, Mr. Speaker. 
One more opportunity to the Premier. Will you support the City of Toronto? Answer. Will you apologize to the Mayor of Toronto? Will you do the right thing for the people of Toronto? Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Premier? Mr. Speaker, um, will we support the City of Toronto? Yes, absolutely, and we are. Let me, let me talk about housing, Mr. Speaker. The uh, member from Stormont is warned, and the Minister of uh, Community Safety is warned. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, look, I'm glad that the federal government is interested in investing in housing, Mr. Speaker. We're actually investing in housing. So $2 billion in affordable and sustainable housing across the province over the next three years. And on Toronto specifically, Mr. Speaker, $130 million for social housing repair. $340 million for homelessness prevention, $130 million for affordable housing, Mr. Speaker, and a specific request by the Mayor of Toronto, provincial land worth up to $100 million to build 2,000 new affordable renting housing Answer. units in the city. Mr. Speaker, we are there, we are investing, and we are working with the city and with the federal government because we need all players at the table, but we are already there, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, why did the Liberals block an attempt to put cameras on school buses to catch drivers that are blowing by school bus stop signs? Can the Premier explain why her Liberals did this? Very good question. Thank you. I know the Minister of Transportation is going to want, is going to, want to speak to, uh, to this, but Mr. Speaker, let me just say that uh, we are very eager to see a piece of legislation go through committee that would make school zones safer, Mr. Speaker, that would allow because remember, remember, Mr. Speaker, school zones are not just about school buses, they are about all the kids who walk to school, whose parents drive them to school, and we believe Madam Kent Essex is warned. We believe that as uh, municipal leaders from different parts of the province have asked that having, uh, having the opportunity to have uh, photo radar in those, in those districts, Mr. Speaker, will keep communities safer. That's what municipal leaders have asked us for, and we're very eager to get that piece of legislation yes, through. We wish that the opposition was as eager to get that legislation through yes. committee, Mr. Speaker. Yes. What's wrong with making it better? Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier did not answer my question. The question was why did the Liberal members vote down an attempt to make sure that you can't have drivers block, drive right by a school bus? It happens all the time. A Mississauga pilot project found each bus had on average two blow-bys a day. Children are at risk. And we have the Premier answering an unrelated question. I want to know why they voted down this amendment. I want to know why Liberals are saying no to a common-sense idea. It shouldn't matter that it's a Conservative amendment. It shouldn't matter that it's a good idea from this side. Do the right thing for children. No more partisan games. Support our children. Will you support this amendment? I will do it again, yes or no? Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I know we, uh, we covered some of this ground yesterday. I've said not only in this chamber, but I've said this to media, I've said this repeatedly, uh, any measure that can be brought forward that will help us deal with those who are most vulnerable on our roads, on our streets, supporting our municipalities like Toronto, Ottawa, and so many others is something that the Ministry of Transportation and this government will always look at very seriously. Speaker, I think it's really important to note that there is nothing that currently stops school buses from having cameras on them at this current time. It is measures. In fact, in some communities like Ottawa, there are pilot programs for which this technology has already been deployed. But fundamentally, what this is about today, Speaker, this question from the leader of that party, following up on the, uh, the situation that took place in this chamber yesterday, Speaker, fundamentally, that leader— member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned, and the member from Leeds Grenville is warned. If you haven't got the message, I'll give it to you. Finish. Thanks very much, Speaker. Fundamentally, that leader is embarrassed, and rightly so, because for day after day after day in this chamber during debate on Bill 65, his members stood up and repeatedly, through every single ploy at the Answer. wall to try and delay passage, they've repeated the same shameless or shameful behavior at committee, Speaker. They brought forward hundreds Thank of amendments you. to this legislation to go. Thanks, <clears throat> Prime Minister, when I stand, you sit. 
Supplement, final supplement. My question was about having cameras on school buses to prevent cars that simply drive by and put the children's safety, school children's safety, at risk. This government is good at answering different questions. They do not want to explain why their members voted down this reasonable amendment. And I, I, I get it. There's, there's politics at play here. It was a good idea from a progressive conservative MPP. A good idea from a progressive Conservative MPP shouldn't be voted down by the government majority simply because it's not a Liberal idea. So here's another opportunity. You want to find someone who also supports this idea? Mayor Bonnie Crombie. Our children are being subjected to a high rate of risk or injury or fatality every time they exit school buses because of a concerning number of drivers simply do not stop when school buses stop to let off. Question. Bonnie Crombie wants cameras on school buses. Parents want cameras on school buses to protect their children. Will the government do the right thing and not this petty partisan politics and voting against a motion that they know is good, that they know is the best interest of our children? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. I, I said in my initial response uh, here today on this that there is currently nothing that stops this technology from being used. And, in, in, you know, communities like Ottawa and Mississauga and others have been contemplating deploying this technology, Speaker. Pilot programs exist. I'm sure more of that will take place. And again, let me stress, the Ministry of Transportation will always take a serious look at any measure that's brought forward that will actually help us deal with road safety. But, Speaker, again, Again, this question, this line of questioning, the press releases that have gone out, and the shameful behavior of that leader, Patrick Brown's members at committee this week, Speaker, more than 300 amendments put forward to delay and disrupt this bill, Bill 65, from passing committee, coming back to third reading here in this chamber, Speaker, so it can be considered. Speaker, fundamentally, it is disgraceful. It's something that's not befitting a leader. It's not befitting members of his caucus. We should be working together on this. It's about the kids. It's about vulnerable road users, Speaker. We want Bill 65 passed, and I call on that leader and that member and others. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question. The leader of the third party. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, this legislature heard about Olive Bird from Sudbury. Olive spent two nights in the ER, 20 nights in the hospital TV room, and one night in the shower room. All across Ontario, people in our hospitals are being treated in hallways, broom closets, TV rooms, and in the showers. Stories like Olive's are the result of a decade of Liberal cuts. The Premier should take a moment and ask herself why the government is crowing about a budget that is $300 million short of the hospital funding that's needed. Will this Premier take responsibility for creating this horror story in our hospitals? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, we have, uh, we have uh, invested, as a result of this budget, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, an additional $7 billion wow. it, for health care over the next three years, Mr. Speaker. We recognize, we recognize that there is a need for uh, this kind of investment, and that includes over $500 million in funding, over half a billion dollars specifically for Ontario's hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and that represents a 2 percent minimum funding increase for each hospital around the province and, Mr. Speaker, across the board, over 3 percent increase. So we recognize that there is a need for hospitals, and we have heard from the Ontario Hospital Association that this is, uh, this is a substantial increase, Mr. Speaker. We also recognize that there is a need for increased investment in home care and, Mr. Speaker, the OHIP Plus Pharmacare Plan, yes, which will allow young people from the age of 0 to 24 to access free medication, Mr. Speaker. All of that recognizes health care is fundamental to this province. Supplementary. Speaker, there are stories like olives all across our province. Jamie Lee Ball is here in the legislature today. I want to thank her for speaking up. She showed up. 
she showed up at Brampton Civic Hospital with internal bleeding. As a result of the Premier's cuts to hospital budgets, instead of getting care in a hospital room, Jamie Lee spent five days on a stretcher in a hallway. Does the Premier think that that's acceptable, Speaker? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, first let me just say to uh, Jamie Lee, I'm not sure which person you are, but um, I'm sorry that that happened to you, and I think that uh, we need to recognize that those situations shouldn't happen, which is exactly why, Mr. Speaker, there is such a substantial increase in funding in our budget for health care across the province, including a substantial increase in funding directly to hospitals, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work uh, as the health care system transforms, because the reality is, Mr. Speaker, there is more need for care in communities. Communities, Mr. Speaker. There's also need for investment in capital, Mr. Speaker. I was, uh, I was at uh, the Trillium uh, Health Centre this, this week, Mr. Speaker, to announce with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance increased funding so that there could be a new facility built in that province. region, Mr. Speaker. That is yes, happening sir. across the province, and we recognize that on top of that, the increase to operating budgets is extremely important. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, these situations are happening because this Premier and her government have made them happen. It is their fault that these things are happening. They caused these things to happen. Hallway medicine is absolutely a direct, direct result of Liberal cuts. Introducing a budget that barely keeps up with inflation does not fix the problem either, Speaker. So let's be clear. This budget will not fix hospital overcrowding. It won't end hallway medicine. It's a slap in the face to the Olives and the Jamie Lees and every other person in Ontario who's stacked up in a hospital hallway, a broom closet, a TV room, a shower. Will the Premier take responsibility for a decade of Liberal health cuts, stop bragging about a budget that barely keeps up with inflation, and commit to actually fixing this problem Question. for the patients that use hospitals you. here in Ontario? You see her, please? You see her, please? The Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Brampton Civic, which is part of the William Osler Health System, that's why, and they're facing unprecedented population yeah. growth there as well. That's why we increased the budget last year of that hospital system by six. 0.5 percent, Mr. Speaker, by $31 million. That's why just recently, several weeks ago, the Premier opened the Peel Memorial Wellness Centre, which is in the same catchment area, to provide and enhance uh, health services to that population. But this year alone, more than half a billion dollars, a 3 percent increase to the bottom line, the base funding for our hospitals. We're currently building 35 or redeveloping 35 hospitals. The new Mississauga Hospital as well that 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 was built and so I want and and I've said clearly to um, answer you're, you're in the, to uh, Ms. Ball uh, I've said clearly in this legislature that it's completely unacceptable what happened to you at Brampton Civic that's why we're making these investments Thank you. so that your situation never happens again Thank you. new question the leader of the third party Thank you speaker my next question is for the premier yesterday I was in Peterborough where I met Louise she has asthma and COPD, and she's older than 24. She pays $300 a month out of her own pocket for her drug insurance. That's $3,600 a year. Under our plan, Louise wouldn't be pay paying out of pocket for insurance. Why is this premier refusing Louise coverage for the medications that she needs? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as I have said, um, there actually is no disagreement between the leader of the third party and me and our party on the need for a national pharmacare plan, Mr. Speaker, that would cover all Canadians across this country. It's something we've been advocating for for a number of years, Mr. Speaker. Our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has taken the lead on that. We have 
Uh, as a result of this budget, we will have in place a program as of January 1, 2018, that will cover 4 million Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, young people from the age of zero until their 20, 25th birthday, and all of their medications for all of their conditions, Mr. Speaker. That's more than 4,000. 400 medications will be covered by OHIP plus Pharmacare. This is a huge leap forward, Mr. Speaker. This is the biggest change in Medicare in, uh, yes, I sir. say, a generation. The Minister of Health says since Medicare came into uh, to place, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's more to be done, and we look for Thank that you. National Pharmacare Plan. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the people of Ontario look to the government to lead on a national pharmacare plan by starting right here in Ontario, and they are not leading. Can you see that, please? Start the clock. Start the clock. Order. Please finish. Another drug plan is not universal pharmacare, Speaker, and that health minister knows it, and that premier knows it. For pharmacare to really work, it needs to be universal. Bottom line, Dr. Steve Morgan is one of the preeminent experts on pharmacare in our country. He wrote, responding to the Liberal budget and their drug plan, and he said the Liberal drug plan will provide quote coverage to the age group Question. that uses medicines the least often. Many working age Canadians or Ontarians rather who are far more likely to require medicines than children will still remain uninsured. Thank you. Universal Pharmacare working age people. Thank you. The member from Ottawa South is warned. Premier. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I think we should all be celebrating the fact that Ontario is demonstrating leadership to the rest of Canada, demonstrating that national pharmacare is possible, that when we take those bold and correct decisions, we will arrive at a place where all Ontarians, all Canadians are able to access the full complement of medicines. In Ontario's case, that's more than 4,400 medicines, and they should be able to do so without any annual deductible and without any co-payment, Mr. Speaker. And so, and I know the member opposite was in Peterborough yesterday. I hope when she spoke with families in the media, she told them of our PharmaCare program coming in January 1st, subject to the budget being passed, which which will benefit 34,000 children 34, and young people in Peterborough alone. Answer. You know, I have to say I was somewhat surprised that more than 11,000 families in Peterborough are going they have children they will benefit from this program Thank you. and starting the beginning Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, according to the experts, working age people need drug coverage the most. Apparently, the Liberals just don't care about them because the Liberal drug plan will not help them. It will leave people like, the, like Louise and thousands and thousands of other people in Peterborough, millions of people around the province, paying their thousands and thousands of dollars out of their own pockets for the medications that they need. Even worse, it leaves millions of people unable to even afford the medications that they should be taking. Will this Premier actually step up to the plate? Be real with the people of Ontario, be honest with the folks out there, and realize that the only way to get to a national pharmacare plan is by taking that step here in Ontario and having Question. a real universal pharmacare plan, not another drug plan in our province. Minister. Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, their plan is not universal. They have a co-payment that is income-tested. They have 4,275 fewer drugs than we do. They're, they have an aspirational target of 2020. Ours begins in January 1st of next year. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Nav Perso, an expert, Nav Perso. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. The leader of the third party is warned. The member, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport is warned. I'm not losing my resolve. Finish, please. Steve Morgan, an expert on pharmacare who st stood sat side by side with the leader of the third party as she made her announcement, said, Bravo to our program. Said it's critically important. Nav Perso said, who's another expert here in Toronto, this announcement is potentially Answer. historic. Daniel Martin lauded it and applauded it as well. Virtually every expert out there is saying our plan is Thank a you. giant leap forward towards universal farm. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We've been asking questions all week long about the troubled mortgage lender, Home Capital, and their chairman, Kevin Smith. They received a $2 billion bailout from the Healthcare Ontario Pension Plan, or HOOP, where the same Kevin Smith is also on their board. Now, Jim Cohane is HOOP's CEO, and he was also on the board of Home Capital. You see, Speaker, both guys are with both companies, the borrower and the lender. So after the $2 billion deal— Second conversation taking place goes outside. And somebody's already on the warning list, which means you can't come back. Finish, please. The $2 billion deal was, uh, was done. They resigned from each other's boards all within 24 hours. Does anybody believe this passes the smell test? Where is the oversight? I asked the Premier for a definitive answer. Is an investigation into this perceived conflict of interest underway? Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. And I appreciate the question yet again. We have made it clear that OSFI, which is a regulator federally overseeing home capital, is involved. We have the Ontario Securities Commission, which is the regulator, also involved and in which predicated some of what's happening now because they're doing their job, Mr. Speaker, in regards to the activities of home capital. Furthermore, we have FISCA, which is the uh, provincial regulator, who has also been involved throughout the process and has already taken action against two individuals. Mr. Speaker, the member is making accusations with regards to some of the directors on the board. He's rightly stated that they have resigned to avoid conflicts of interest. But the matter is before the regulators. It is being reviewed. We're allowing them to do their job, Mr. Speaker. Even the federal minister of finance has referenced that as well. Thank Answer. you. Thank you. Supplementary. To the premier, please. As chair of Home Capital, Kevin Smith earns $357,000 a year for a total of a million and a half in stock. This is a big job. He attended 31 meetings last year. The company is troubled. They're under OSC investigation. Their depositors are leaving. Their stock is tumbling. This is all hands on deck time. But Smith is also the $720,000 a year CEO of St. Joseph Health System and Niagara Health System. He earns $14,000 a week and took six weeks just to attend Home Capital's meetings. His hospital contract states, quote, the employee shall devote his whole of his working time and attention to the business uh, and affairs of the system. If the government is paying that kind of money, you would expect full-time service. While the Premier has been cutting and gutting St. Joe's and other hospitals, where was Kevin Smith? Question, thank you. <laughs> Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Again, the member opposite, I think, rightly understands and knows that both Home Capital and Hoop are independent of government, and they're private uh, organizations, and, they have, and the directors themselves have fiduciary duties primarily to support and protect the interests of their respective companies. And, Mr. Speaker, that is what we regulate. That is what is being done as we speak. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. 85% of Ontarians want Hydro One to stay public. 
Public ownership means money for our hospitals and for our schools. It means lower costs for families and for businesses. It means ensuring our electricity system serves Ontarians, those instead of private investors. Can the Premier tell Ontarians why her budget doubles down on the sale of Hydro One? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I was pleased to talk about the great work that Hydro One is doing at becoming a better run company, Mr. Speaker, um, being more customer focused and recognizing that uh, they can do better. And we've seen that, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the broadening uh, ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, we're on track to raise the $9 billion, and $4 billion of that, Mr. Speaker, will be going directly to infrastructure. $13.5 billion in the GTHA, the GO Regional Express Rail, will quadruple, Mr. Speaker, the number of weekly trips to 6,000. $5.3 billion in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, tripling the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund to $300 million, Mr. Speaker, which will then continue to see more infrastructure built in this province. We're building Ontario up, Mr. Speaker. We're creating jobs, and Hydro yes, One and broadening the ownership of that is one small part of our overall plan, Mr. Hey. Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier, people think selling Hydro One is a bad idea. Businesses think selling Hydro One is a bad idea. Energy experts think selling Hydro One is a bad idea. In fact, everyone thinks selling Hydro One is a bad idea. I, I would guess a large number of those MPPs on that side of the chamber think it's a bad idea, and I know their constituents. I know their constituents think it's a bad idea. The Premier could have shown that she gets it. The budget could have stopped the sell-off. People got a message from the budget. The only way to stop the sell-off of Hydro One is to change government. Does the Premier get that? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the people in Mississauga and Brampton think the $1.4 billion in the Huron, Ontario LRT is a good idea, Mr. Speaker. The people in the Waterloo regional area, um, they see their regional transit hub of $43 million, Mr. Speaker, is a good idea. I know $173 million being spent to expand Highway 69 and making that a four-lane highway. I know the folks in Sudbury, they think that's a good idea, Mr. Speaker. The one thing, the one thing I know, Mr. Speaker, that the people of Ontario don't think is a good idea is that party, Mr. Speaker. Seated, yeah. please. Seated. New question, the member from Davenport. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Ministry of Education. With the best possible start in life through our publicly funded education system. Our government has made significant gains in all four publicly funded education systems to provide a strong foundation for our students. Each year, during the first week of May, Ontario's education community comes together to honour student achievement and education excellence. I know that last month our government announced the details of the grants for student needs for the upcoming school year. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you share with this House the great investments this government is making to help better support students in the classroom and continue to improve education for our children? Thank you, Minister of Education. Uh, merci, Monsieur President. And Thank you, Mr. Thank you Speaker. Question, and I want to thank her for the work she's doing in her, on behalf of her constituents. We were just there this morning with uh, students from the French Public, French Catholic School Board. It was a great morning. I also want to welcome the students that are visiting Queen's Park today and those that are watching because, Mr. Speaker, this is Education Week. It is time to pay tribute to the dedication and commitment of students, parents, teachers, and education workers across this province. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who works tirelessly to support Ontario's children and students. Guided by our renewed vision for education, Ontario's publicly funded education system continues to build on its world-class reputation. I was proud to announce that Ontario is increasing its investments to students and to schools this coming school year, total education funding Answer. will increase to $23.8 billion. That's an increase of approximately $879 million, $12,100 per student. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks, Minister. 
the accomplishments and investments we continue to make in education. And I was pleased to join you, Minister, in my riding of Davenport this morning, à l'école secondaire Toron West and l'école secondaire Saint Fré André, to meet with students and principals Sharp and Wambo. I know that for them and for students and educators across Ontario, this means smaller class sizes, more staff and special education, and a focus on local community needs. Mr. Speaker, this year we are also marking another important occasion. Canada and Ontario are celebrating their 150th anniversaries. Schools provide an essential space to enhance understanding of our shared history and to build our collective future. That's why I'm pleased to hear that Ontario 150 is the theme of this year's Education Week. Minister, can you please tell us how we are celebrating Education Week and Ontario 150, engaging parents and students across the Thank you, Minister. Speaker to the Minister of, of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, our 150th the MPP for Davenport. How much we can accomplish when we work together, and also a chance to engage our next generation, our students. The Ministry of Education and my ministry have made empowering youth a priority in this year's celebration, and that's why we've created a youth partnership program. This Ontario 150 Youth Partnership Program is supporting 87 youth-led projects that will help our youth give exciting opportunities to them to actively participate in their communities, both inside and outside the classroom. We're funding a great range of exciting and unique projects, including youth leadership programs, dance and theatre workshops, women's hockey programs, and entrepreneurship programs for Indigenous youth in remote First Nations communities. As we celebrate Ontario's legacy, yes, these projects will chart our future. Mr. Speaker, this Education Week, we have much to celebrate, and as the song goes, Mr. Speaker, Thank we you. are a place to stand and a place to grow. We are. Question, the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. The Minister of Finance claims their plan is going to stabilize the real estate market and stop the out-of-control price increases of housing. So, can he explain why his budget document predicts an increase of almost 500 million? in land transfer taxes next year. Does the minister still expect the price of homes to increase that much, or is that number wrong? Thank you, Minister Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, transactions of real estate activity will continue, and uh, in fact, the economists and independent uh, individuals predicted even greater activity throughout the years, and we tempered that amount just to be prudent, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and that's that's how it's proceeding. And in regards to the market itself and the measures that we've taken to address a cool demand at the same time increase supply into the mix are appropriate measures to provide greater predictability sustainability but market forces will prevail mr speaker there's no doubt of that what we want to make certain though is we provide certain measures and assistance while we proceed forward in the marketplace thank you supplementary well thank you mr speaker it appears the government has no idea what they're doing when it comes to housing one day the minister of finance says foreign home buyers are eight percent of the market the next day, he says there are only 5 percent of the market. Now the Toronto Real Estate Board says it's less than 1 percent of the market. He claims a foreign home buyer's tax will stabilize that market. But the budget documents show the government is expecting housing prices to keep rising and, the result, and result in another, another $500 million in land transfer tax. Either the government's housing measures are going to fail and prices will keep going up, or the government has almost a $500 million hole in their budget. Can the minister tell us which it is? Thank you, Minister. Well, I can tell this House that obviously they have no plan yet again on this file because they've offered no solutions and no ideas. We put forward a 16-point plan of comprehensive measures to address with many things, one of which is speculation. Try to ensure that if you're a non-resident Canadian and you're speculating on someone's home and crowding out families that want to live here, put up roots here, start a family here, build up equity here, well, then they're going to have to pay a little bit more, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we've done in this measure. We have also done that with domestic speculators to ensure that they don't crowd out those families and that they too should pay their fair share. It's one of 16 measures that we're doing to increase supply, address demand, and ensure the people of Ontario have a better opportunity at home ownership, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Thank you.
member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, is warned. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, while there was nothing in the budget about minimum wage or any improvements to outdated labour standards for that matter, the Premier does have a new minimum wage Facebook ad up, money well spent, I'm sure. In the ad, the Premier asks Ontarians if they agree with a raise to the minimum wage. Well, I think I can answer that question, Speaker. Seventy percent of Ontarians have already said they want a $15 minimum wage. One in ten Ontario workers make minimum wage today, and low-income work is on the rise. Ontario New Democrats have heard these hard-working Ontarians, and we committed in April of 2016 to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Will the Premier commit today to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Labor. Minister of Labor. Speaker, thank you very much to uh, the member for the question. And Speaker, on this side of the House, what we want to ensure is that every family in this province benefits from the strong economy that we have in the province of Ontario today. The world of work is changing, Speaker. We're seeing jobs in place that simply didn't exist a few years ago, Speaker, and we need to be aware that the world is changing. That is why, that's precisely why this is the party, this is the government that put the Changing Workplaces Review into place almost two years ago, Speaker. These gentlemen that we appointed have travelled the province of Ontario. They've got advice from organized labour. They've got advice from business. Poverty advocates, Speaker, they've got advice as to what the government should do. Speaker, the report is finished. It's being translated, Speaker. It will be on my desk very, very shortly. It will be in the hands of the public very, very shortly. Answer. And it speaks exactly to the types of questions that the member is asking, Speaker. We're prepared to do the right thing in this Thank regard. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. On February 23rd, in response to an NDP question, the Liberal Labour Minister once again would only answer that the scheduled minimum wage increase is predictable. He repeated the same on March the 8th and again on April the 25th. And any time this Liberal government has been asked if they'll raise the minimum wage, the answer has always been the same, predictable. So I asked the Speaker, will the Premier commit to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour today, predictably? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, as the Premier said publicly, this is more uh, than just protecting people's wages and their ability to earn a good living. It's about that, Speaker, but it's about so much more. It's about the way that the world of work is changing. What we did a few years back, Speaker, is we got all parties that were interested in this. We got them around the same table. We established a process. We set a foundation for the minimum wage, Speaker. We got opinions from organized labor, from business, from poverty advocates, for everybody, from the workers themselves, Speaker. We got everybody who was interested in this issue. We got them around the same table. We put a process in place, Speaker, for the past few years has worked very, very well, Speaker. What I will say, Speaker, is that at the time we tried to get everybody who was interested to the table, the NDP didn't come to the table, Speaker. That was the time to speak out, Speaker. They were missing in action when they were needed the most. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for poverty reduction strategy. Speaker, evidence shows that the 1991 exemption on rent controls has not resulted in new rental units being built. In fact, in Ontario, 14,000 rental units were built in 1991. Yet five years later, after rent controls were removed for new builds, the number of new rental units dropped to under 1,000. And according to housing lawyer Timothy Collins, rent regulations have been the single source of affordable housing for middle- and low-income households. Speaker, despite this evidence, the official opposition refuses to accept that rent controls are not the reason why developers are not constructing new units. Instead of looking at the facts, the opposition has voted against a motion that would have fast-tracked the Rental Fairness Act. Speaker, the longer the opposition stalls, the longer tenants will have to go without the protections from unreasonable rent hikes. Question. So, Speaker, can the minister please explain to this House how rent control is very important to strengthening our community? Thank you. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. And to the member from Beaches East York for his question and his uh, continued advocacy on this very important issue. Speaker, the economist uh, Jason Mason argues that rent controls give tenants a greater stake in their community and incentivizes them to put time, energy, and even money into their homes. 
As Liberals, we believe in inclusive neighbourhoods where people have the confidence to put down roots. The full removal of the 1991 exemption would ultimately result in better outcomes for tenants and significantly improve housing affordability in Ontario. Speaker, we do not want to create another two-tiered rental market housing system where tenants in newer units are vulnerable to unaffordable rent increases. Going forward, Speaker, every renter in Ontario Answer. will have the peace of mind knowing their rent is not going to increase beyond roughly the rate of inflation. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his very complex and very thoughtful response to finding opportunities for affordable housing in Ontario. In the last week, I had the opportunity to listen to a lot of the debate on the Rental Fairness Act. And as you know, Speaker, the Act would expand rent controls to all rental units, including those built or occupied after 1991. So if passed, the bill will bring predictability, affordability, and opportunity to Ontario's rental market. But during debate, the official opposition party has made it clear they believe expanding rent controls would, as the member from Oxford said, create the biggest chill on building in the rental market. And also, the member from Niagara West Glanbrook even referenced an overly dramatic quote stating that after bombing, nothing destroys a city sooner than rent control. Speaker, would the minister please set the record straight and explain to the House how expanding rent controls, along with the suite of incentives that are contained Question. in the Fair Housing Plan, will not restrain but will encourage the building of new rental units? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member from uh, Beaches East York for the question. Uh, Speaker, it's regrettable the, uh, the official opposition needs to paint such an unpleasant view of the world to justify their positions. In fact, it is a fact of matter. Uh, the fact of the matter, Speaker, is that Ontario is constantly ranked as one of the top places to live in terms of stability, health care, education, environment, and infrastructure. As a result, people are moving and investing in Ontario. Speaker, I would also like to point out that 80 per cent of the rental market is currently protected by rent control. And you know what, Speaker? These rental units continue to appreciate in value and attract new capital investment. And, sir, Speaker, the real world is nothing like the grim world view of the opposition. The reality is that by passing this bill— Thank you. New question. The member from Dufferin Calvin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. On Monday, we learned that in the last 10 years, there's been a 60 percent increase in hospitalization and emergency room visits by children and youth due to mental health disorders. The minister responded by suggesting that drugs were the answer. Does the minister truly believe that the solution for this mental health crisis is providing free drugs? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm quite certain that that wouldn't have been my response. <laughs> Mr. 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 So I, I'll give the opportunity to the member opposite to perhaps clarify uh, her recollection in the supplementary, but I'm uh, very proud of the investments that we have made and are making in children and youths and adults' mental health, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we, when we first launched our five-year plan for mental health that came out of a select committee of all parties that gave remarkable advice uh, to the government, to this government, uh, we focused in the first instance on children's mental health, and we were able to expand the services to more than 50,000 additional children that would benefit. Uh, we made investments uh, in the orders of hundreds of millions of dollars, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, we continue that important work, and we're investing in the transit that critically important transitional uh, period Answer. Uh, the, uh, mental health uh, services for youth and i'm happy to talk including about what we've announced in the budget last week mr speaker thank you supplementary thank you i'm pleased that you were talking about the select committee on mental health and addictions but that was 8 years ago minister today 12,000 children and youth are waiting for mental health services in ontario in Toronto, the average wait time for counselling and therapy service is 208 days. In Barrie, the wait time is 354 days. In Ottawa, children wait 575 days for mental health services. 
Our kids can't wait. Instead of suggesting that drugs are the answer, when will this minister ensure timely access to counselling and therapy service for our children? Thank you. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the member opposite mentioned Barry, and I might have to defer to the member from Barry for part of this answer because not that long ago, several months ago, we announced a brand new child and youth mental health service in Barry at the Royal Victoria Hospital, an inpatient service, Mr. Speaker, but also an outpatient service, which is going to benefit 50, 000, tens of thousands of children and youth in that area, Mr. Speaker, and it's at one, merely one example of the investments that we're making. $140 million of additional funds announced uh, in this budget, Mr. Speaker, for cognitive behavioral therapy, for a proven uh, 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 psychotherapy intervention, which is remarkably effective for individuals, including children and youth that have mood disorders such as anxiety Answer. and depression. One 1,150 new supportive housing units. These are the kinds of investments that we continue to make, not just for children and youth, but for the entire population. Thank you. Yeah. New question, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Corrections and Community Safety. Speaker, I, along with other Ontarians, would like to first thank and acknowledge the province's correctional staff for the vital work that they do each and every day on our behalf. Speaker, New Democrats have long called for a new approach to corrections, away from the overcrowded and thereby dangerous facilities in Ontario that have become warehouses. We don't forget that Adam Capay was held in administrative isolation in Thunder Bay Jail for four years before staff and the Human Rights Commissioner, not the minister, first sounded the alarm about his condition. Speaker, when will the Liberal minister provide the resources that have been missing? to implement and enable the recommendations of the Ombudsman, Mr. Sapers, and others to use administrative segregation as a last resort, and when will you end indefinite segregation? Thank you. Mr. Kennedy, thank you, personal services. Uh, well, thank you. I would like to thank the member for his question and, and certainly reiterate the great work that uh, uh, our correctional officers are doing every single day in Ontario, our parole and probation officers, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to say thank you to Mr. Sapers for his uh, report today. Um, you know, I think uh, both Mr. Sapers and the Ombudsman are deeply, uh, the concerns that they're raising are deeply concerned and completely unacceptable. And I acknowledge and we acknowledge we must do better. We must do better. And, and Mr. Saper has recognized the important initiatives and action that our ministry has already taken. He points out that this government's commitment to transform our correctional system. He also clearly points out where we have challenges in this system and that there's much more work Answer. to be done. So, Mr. Speaker, as I announced today, and I will go on my supplement, some key initiatives that we are taking in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The use of administrative segregation and isolation has only increased after 14 years of Liberal government, and now they can't wait to fix it. Yes, more beds are needed, but correctional staff, inmates, and the public don't need another poorly, privately built Toronto South facility with its broken locks and windows and unused nursing stations. Speaker, Ontarians want to know, will this late-to-the-game money be another Liberal make-their-friends-rich scheme? with correctional staff left to pick up the pieces. So I, I will just um, I want to say very clearly in this house, Mr. Speaker, that segregation uh, will only be used as the absolute last resort. And, and certainly, uh, I want to point out that the extremely difficult conditions uh, our correctional officers and our staff are working every day and the tremendous work that they actually do. Mr. Speaker, I have touched upon a number of reform as I alluded this morning, and I want to talk to you about um, some of the designs that you know, our current facilities have, and it's called warehousing inmates. And when we talk about transformation within our correctional system, I think it's important that we look at everything. And that's why this morning we talked about introducing a new legislation, uh, you know, looking at the definition 
of segregation, improving the condition of, in, in, of confinement. Answer. We talked about uh, the aspect to ensure that uh, health care is better delivered in our facilities. So again, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to transforming our correctional system. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of International Trade. As you know, Ontario's economy is flourishing and businesses in all regions of the province are growing. Absolutely. Last year, our GDP grew by 2.7 per cent and nearly 700,000 net new jobs have been created That's since true. the global recession. Our economy is in a state that is conducive to further growth, and I know that the minister's efforts to market Ontario abroad will do just that. Our latest budget outlines the importance of ensuring that Ontario businesses have the ability to expand abroad and grow the province's economy here at home. Over the past decade, Ontario has made strides in, in diversifying exports and raising Ontario's profile internationally. That's right. Speaker, can the minister speak to the types of supports that his ministry Question. offers for companies looking to scale up and increase their market share in both developed and emerging markets? Thank you. Minister of International Trade. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member from Barry for asking. Speaker, as the member had mentioned, Ontario's economy is globally competitive and our proactive approach to diversify trade will continue. As part of our global trade strategy, Ontario offers a wide range of support for local businesses that include introductory exporter education seminar and workshop, one-on-one -on -one consulting, incoming buyer programs in market trade supports, and outbound missions that include participation in exhibitions. Speaker, in 2015 alone, Ontario led 71 trade missions, in which 699 companies started exporting to new markets, generating an estimated $941 million Answer. in potential export sales. Companies around the world, around the province, are taking advantage of our support. This is a result of insignificant growth of our export capacity. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is exciting to hear about the increasing amount of companies that are making use of the Ministry's trade supports as a mean to diversify their revenue source. However, with the constant shifting of the global trade climate, it is increasingly more important to ensure that Ontario is not simply reliant on one single export market. Right. One of the ways of facilitating trade with emerging markets is to work at reducing and eliminating barriers to access. I know that business owners in my riding of Barrie appreciate the ability to freely access foreign markets thanks to the support of this ministry. Speaker, through you to the minister, can the minister speak to the work our government has done to reduce trade barriers and provide greater access to emerging markets? Question, minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I want to thank the honourable member from Barrie for asking again. Speaker, our government has long prioritised trade diversification in both the market that we trade and the sectors that we trade within those markets. This is why our government has invested $15 million over three years to expand Ontario's footprint in key international markets around the globe. Speaker, as the member mentioned, in reducing and eliminating barriers is a good way of limiting trade dependency. This is why our government worked tirelessly to ensure that comprehensive trade agreements like CEDA will sign. Speaker, I know that all Ontarians will feel the benefits of this deal as it will save $100 million in tariffs annually, Answer. creating roughly 30,000 new Ontario jobs and boasting the province GDP by $4.5 billion. Thank, Thank you, you. Speaker. Uh, the question is member from Niagara, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. I read with interest your ironic news release promising consultation on rural education. It claims you recognize the value that schools bring to students and communities as a whole. Minister, the constituents in my riding know you don't really care. If you did, you would come to Niagara and listen to the people who rely on those community schools. Instead, not a single one of your consultations. Order.
finish, please? Speaker, not a single one of this minister's consultation meetings will be taking place in the Niagara region. Will you step outside of your ivory tower, commit to ensuring Niagara has a voice in the consultation process, and promise there will be a consultation meeting in Niagara? Thank you. A member from Davenport is warned. <coughs> and somebody just saved somebody else from getting warned. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, and, uh, you know it's a pleasure to rise and to speak uh, about our education system, Mr. Speaker, because we have one of the best publicly funded education system in the world. And you know, Mr. Speaker, I I understand the very important role of schools and the importance of schools to communities, which is exactly why we are doing an engagement across this province with yes. our focus on rural. A member from Niagara West Glenbrook is warned. Finish, please. Speaker, with our focus on rural and northern remote communities, Mr. Speaker, uh, just last week I issued uh, an engagement paper that outlines uh, the very importance of focusing on these areas in our province because we want to ensure that Answer. we are providing the best education possible sure. for all students across this province, Mr. Speaker, and we can only do that by listening and uh, engaging. Nonsense, Minister. You don't even want to personally face the rural residents you're hurting. Be Instead, careful. you're sending out your parliament. Oh, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Address the chair. Yes, Speaker. Speaker, the minister doesn't even want to personally face the rural residents she's hurting. Instead, she's sending out her parliamentary assistants to bear the brunt of people's anger and dutifully tell her what she wants to hear. She shouldn't need consultations to know that rural communities don't want their schools closed. These consultations would be redundant if the minister would just issue a moratorium on school closures. But it's doubly insulting and arrogant that she didn't even want to include the communities of Niagara in her parliamentary assistance so-called consultation sessions. So my, my question is very simple. Why is she ignoring the residents of Niagara and the residents of question. rural Ontario? Good question. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, it's very important that we have this consultation because we want students to access the latest classroom technology and a wide range of options, Mr. Speaker. And I know that we're going to hear great things when we engage with our communities. And, and just so the member opposite knows that this Friday I will be in Merrickville, Mr. Speaker, along with uh, with a, with the parliamentary. Uh, they do have a new school there, um, because Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that we hear from all communities across this great province, and we want to ensure that we make those investments in our students, in our communities, in our schools, so that we can provide the best publicly funded education system possible for our students across yes, this province. Mr. Speaker, this is Education Week. We are celebrating our students, celebrating our great teachers and educators, Thank and you. that's why we're engaging in these. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 124, an act to uh, amend the Residential Tendencies Act of 2006. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, take your seats. On April the 25th, 2017, Madame Lalonde moved second reading of Bill 124, an act to amend the Residential Tenancies Act 2006. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Chris. 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 Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Nackley, Mr. Nackley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Dugan, Mr. Dugan, Mr. McCharles, Mr. McCharles, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Mr. Codry, Mr. Codry, Mrs. Mangas, Mrs. Mangas, Mr. Craig. Ms. Domerlet, Ms. McGarry, Ms. McGarry, Ms. Jassy, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Ms. Albanese, Ms. Albanese, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Ms. Nadia Harris, Ms. Nadia Harris, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts. Mr. Ronaldo. 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 Mr.